to meet all of you virtually. I realize it's slightly awkward to uh, be non-physically present, but I really hope we'll have a wonderful discussion after this talk. I just came from uh, getting my second dose of the vaccine. So uh, if this talk is not what you expected, I blame it on that. So let's get started. I wanted to talk to you today about social AI, social artificial intelligence and robotics. Here you can see a little bit of my background, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I am Dutch, I come from the Netherlands and I studied at a bunch of different universities and, uh, and lived in a, in a few different places. At the moment I'm at Nanyang Technological University. You can see that, let's see, here, I'm right in front of it, in Singapore. And um, I am the director of the Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity. It's an institute with researchers of very different disciplinary backgrounds, and they work together in interdisciplinary teams on solving the grand challenges that we are facing today. So um, let me start by just showing you a photo of a typical application area for robots. And we are all seeing robots as a uh, and of course artificial intelligence as a solution to many of the manufacturing and uh, for instance healthcare and other and other problems that really need solving and here's a typical environment where such robots are being used this is your typical warehouse floor and as you can see the environment is quite structured and there are ways that the robots can move and the there are marks on the floor where the people can be, where they can walk, where they can stand. So people have been kind of designed into the structured place for the optimal working of the robots. You can't really say that this is human robot co-work. It's really an environment optimized for robotic operations and people have kind of been reduced to a, a functional role here. Um, here you can see a typical environment of manufacturing of, of lights out manufacturing or lights off manufacturing. And the dream here is of course that, you know, if you have a fully autonomous factory, you won't need any lights, you won't need any air conditioning, you won't need any heating because it's not necessary for robots uh, and computer systems to operate. And this uh, vision of completely full, fully autonomous functioning uh, can be seen as very utopian and it frees us up, frees people up to work on taking care of each other, to pursue arts and music and to have maybe a more leisurely existence. But of course it can also be a very dystopian future where we imagine that uh, important jobs are lost and, and may not be replaced so that people's livelihood comes in danger. What I really want to uh, focus on today is how we can make sure that we develop robots, we develop artificial intelligence that is um, much more an extension uh, of, a, of people, an extension of our capabilities and, and opens up new opportunities for people. Here you can see a typical fully automated uh, factory, car manufacturing factory, and this was of course Elon Musk, Tesla's um, uh, CEO's dream and to have the new Tesla completely autonomously produced by fully autonomous factories. But he had to come back from that idea. Hey, here it says, uh, you know, humans are underrated was something that he mentioned. And it just didn't work out that way. There were too many flaws. Every time uh, something unexpected would happen, uh, a sensor might malfunction or some a little piece of paper or something wafts into one of the cages of the robots, uh, a whole robot would shut down, they have to call ABB, people would have to be flown in from Paris um, and they would have to fix the, the robot, then restart the whole production line, troubleshoot it. You know, it could be days until the production line opens again. And you can imagine in a, in a well-designed factory where humans and systems and robots um, uh, are really, really seamlessly work together, such a thing wouldn't happen. A, a person could walk into the cage and the production line could just move around that and the person could pick up the little piece of paper, take it out and then the production line could continue. So there should be some kind of give and take, almost like a dance between the people and the, and the robots and the computer systems to optimize the flow of, of production in, in such a highly, highly structured environment let alone if we talk about very unstructured environment. 
here's an example of uh, the DARPA grand challenges that you kind of see behind me. And here you can see how challenging it is for a robot for computer systems to autonomously do very different tasks, like walking over rubble, opening a door, driving a car, uh, sewing a hole in a, in, a, in a wall with a saw. And those are very difficult things to do for a robot because robots excel in learning in a very specific context. And so they are able to, to be taught from examples how to behave in a certain context. And then when the context changes and we ask a very different task for them, it's extremely difficult for them to adapt everything that they've learned into this new context. Actually, they can't. They have to be completely relearned. There'll be a new computer, say, that needs to that needs to start up, start learning about that task and, and be optimized and then function. It's very different from how people learn. People learn socially. We learn from each other. And then picture behind me, you can see uh, a chimpanzee, a mother and, and a child. Let me see. There you go. And uh, of course, a, a human mother and a child. And for both of these species, it's extremely important that the child is raised and, and nurtured for it to be able to grow up in a fully functioning adult and a well functioning adult that doesn't have any uh, issues or problems. You could, you could almost say that it's well functioning as a person. And um, this is extremely different, very, very different from, from of course, how computers learn. And computers learn from examples. So you might give a computer lots of, lots of examples, and then after a while, it'll be able to recognize from those examples and I'll, I'll know when it's, when it's a wrong example. And I'll tell a little bit more about you. But we learn socially and robots may be very, very good at repetitive tasks in a very specific given context, but they are not very good at all of learning across context. Whereas we are masters at learning across context. And I'm just fascinated by how that might be leveraged to have better working computers or at least computers that are able to learn in a way that, that fits us better. So when unexpected things happen for a computer, this is very difficult to parse. But when unexpected things happen to us, we thrive and we apply everything that we've learned to solve this problem. We are very creative. Uh, we like to puzzle it out until we understand it. We thrive on those unexpected things and we get bored senseless if we do not see unexpected things. A totally repetitive task does not bring out the best in us. Actually, we'll start making mistakes pretty quickly. So robots learn in a very specific context and we learn across contexts because we learn socially. The big difference uh, between chimpanzees and, and humans is that humans engage in something called active teaching. I've worked together with a, a primate, primatologist, <laughs> with a primatologist, not a primate, uh, Tetsuro Matsudawa. He's really an amazing researcher. If you have the chance to, to look him up, uh, that, uh, to look up his work, it's really fascinating. Uh, but he's arguing that people engage in active learning and an active teaching and also in social referencing. And when we have a child, we look at the child, we smile when they do something well, we may frown if we don't like something and we actively teach. I will take a rattle and show how it works, put it in a little hand and, and show how you can rattle. It's a very active form of teaching. And the social referencing helps for the child to, to internalize teaching moments so we very efficiently teach each other how to use our brains, how to, how to work. And that is something that doesn't happen uh, even with, a, for instance, chimpanzee is a highly, highly intelligent developed ape. Um, there's, a, there's a big difference between uh, uh, humans and, and chimpanzees. And we, we look at our children, we put them in, in chairs and high chairs, we put them in a, in a bugaboo in one of these uh, strollers and we can look at the, at a child and we're constantly, constantly socially referencing to them. But the baby chimpanzee spends most of its time on the mother's back, off the mother's belly, and there is no active teaching, there is no active social referencing. And uh, Matsuzawa argues that 
the development of the mind and the and and the development of culture in people that it's that is fundamentally different in people than in other great apes because of this difference in how we raise our children for us it's characterized by social referencing um, and Matsuzawa argues that this social referencing this social learning allows for the development of for instance empathy altruistic behavior and theory of mind for example there is a chimpanzee group in Uganda, and they are known to teach each other to learn how to open a nut with a rock. And it takes a chimpanzee child seven years to, to have that task. So there's something in social learning that could be a wonderful or interesting model for developing computers that need to work very intensively with us or for us. And uh, I'm not the robots, only one. I'm not the only one to talk about that aspect. I wanted to show you this uh, this video clip. I, I had the opportunity to uh, talk with Daniel Dennett, who's a really uh, famous philosopher, and he tries to figure out where does the mind come from? How does the mind come to exist? And I just wanted to show this clip to you. Um, the, the conversation starts when he explains that people are actually robots made out of robots that are also made out of robots that are also made out of robots. And from there, he continues to talk about his theory of how the mind comes to exist. Robots made of robots, made of robots, made of robots, made of robots. Uh, if you look at a, a single cell, a neuron or an astrocyte, that cell is a sort of autonomous robot of itself. And if you look inside the cell, you find even more robotic parts moving around. Motor proteins are very clearly they're robots. they're not even alive they're, they're just proteins but there they are marching around inside the cell um, carrying goods um, creating little highways and then walking along the highways doing all the transport that's needed inside the cell those are robots for sure they're nano robots not a single one of those knows who you are or cares but how does the mind talk about That's the question that concerns me the most. How in the world do you ever get that out of 200 billion clueless little robots? And the answer, I think, is only because of enculturation, only through culture. It's the evolution of culture that makes thousands of thinking tools, thousands of informational devices that are all designed, ready to use, that get installed in our brains, roughly the way you install an app on your, on your smartphone. And these give a human brain all these other powers. They work together and they create functional architectural levels which simply don't and can't exist in the mind of even a chimpanzee. So it's the, it's the software, the levels and levels of software that are imposed on the underlying hardware of the brain that, that do all the work that make the consciousness. That's, that's my theory. It's, it's, it's controversial and speculative, but I have, I think, some pretty good arguments for it. I find this a very inspiring way of thinking. Learning seems to be highly dependent on enculturation, on social referencing, something like enculturation or the ability to be able to enculture, to, to develop a culture together. So in my work, I've tried to delve deeper into that. And I started with this notion of beho behavior that we have learned through social referencing. Uh, and that is it's very different in very different cultures. Um, what is normal is different as you go from culture to another culture, is socially normative behavior. Uh, and how to translate these socially normative behaviors to artificial intelligence and robotics is something that my group and I have been working on in, say, the last 15 years about. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what I mean with uh, socially normative behaviors um, before I give you some examples of, of what that AI and what those robots look like. So here you can see a picture of myself when I grew up. This is the environment where I grew up in Nigeria, where I lived with my parents. And the environment where you grow up is where you learn everything. You learn how to behave. You learn to feel 
how you should behave, what is a normal way to behave. And when you don't behave in a normal way, um, there are there are repercussions. People will will feel threatened. They they won't they won't trust you because there is a normal way to act, and and you have to you have to accommodate that to be able to fit into into local society. And uh, here's a, a little example of what that looks like when you when you go across social norms. I'm sure all of you have had that experience when you've been abroad and you behave in a way that is not expected there and, and you basically make a cultural faux pas. It's kind of funny when you think back, but there are real social repercussions. Here you can see, you know, when you don't stick to the social norm of keeping a certain personal distance, um, the results are that people feel threatened, they will react aggressively, uh, they will they will definitely uh, not think that you're doing a very good job in socializing. And it's crazy to think that every single piece of technology that we use is kind of like this guy. It's not adhering to the social norms. It is oblivious to the social norms. Yet we are asked to work with this technology in our work, at schools, in hospitals, in public spaces, predominantly social spaces where well, we are supposed to work with this technology that is oblivious to our social environment. And of course, every workplace is social in nature. And there are examples where technology can completely work on its own. Uh, AI may make, may make decisions completely isolated from any social situation. But it's, it's in rare cases. And there's an, a, a robot operating on Mars that is, uh, that is being completely isolated from humans, but still there are expectations. People on this planet have expectations of what that robot is supposed to do. And when it doesn't respond in the way that they think it might, they are puzzled. So in, in any way, this idea of, I understand you, you understand me. There is a way that we behave because we have a, a social contract together. It's, it's very important for optimized collaboration. And I think that is the same when it comes to optimizing technological use for us. So what I've been trying to do is to build uh, social artificial intelligence, computers and robots that are able to deal with incidental social interactions, are able to engage in a real-time dialogue, ongoing dialogue in a, in a social setting towards socially interpreting, so automatically understanding what the social situation is in which the technology has to work towards social referencing, like we do with each other, that we learn just from a glance uh, that something is right or wrong, or that we should do it differently towards something that uh, I want to call social artificial intelligence because it's the simplest way to describe it. Here you can see, I'm just going to turn the music down, the sound down. This is a French TV station that uh, did a news item on the robot that we developed. Uh, I think this was around the early 2000s. Uh, we developed the robot Frog, Fun Robotic Outdoor Guide. And this is in the Royal Alcazar in Sevilla in Spain. And there were many technological challenges to this robot that made it interesting. If you start putting robotic services outdoor in public spaces, what does that look like? There's sun and there's shade. So for computer vision, it's extremely challenging. You have marble floors, you have pebble floors, you have grass, so for navigation, localization, it's extremely challenging. Uh, there is interaction that needs to happen with people. In this case, a robot would show scenes historical scenes from the past through overlays of augmented reality. And it would engage people, tell them more about the history of the place. And at the same time, it would gauge their interest. So it would analyze their facial expressions to find out if they were interested in the content that they were seeing and adapt the content accordingly. And here you can kind of see what that looks like. So from, from visualization of, of the computer's algorithm. So it would analyze people's facial expressions as they were as they were looking at the content. And over time, we gave it many examples of faces of interested people. These are interested faces, and these are people that are not interested. And over time, a computer was able to uh, extract those features that predicted interest, and then was able to more automatically uh, detect that from human faces. And this work is, is done by Maya Pantic, who at the time uh, was in our group and at Imperial College London. Uh, at the moment she's working at Facebook, but fascinating research where she is, I would say, hands down the best person on earth to extract uh, facial features. And these 
this was in the early 2000s. You can imagine outside with the cameras at the time and the computer power that we had at the time that she was able to detect felons and arousal in facial expressions. You can see her here with her research team. Uh, it's really amazing. So we can, and you can see here from these examples, from this example behind me, again, the computer was fed examples of people that were happy, people that were sad, people that were disgusted. And over time, it would extract those features, maybe the corners of their eyes, the corners of their mouths, those features that predicted mostly what, what valence and arousal was there. So what emotion people had. So the computer could detect automatically kind of basic emotions from facial features. Uh, Another important aspect at the time was, of course, this robot was envisioned to operate out outdoors uh, in pedestrian areas. So it would have to be extremely safe and it would have to analyze uh, people's movement behaviors. And uh, so localization and, and outdoor cameras at the time, early 2000s, we were doing most things in the lab uh, environment. So it was extremely challenging to move that outdoors and reliably detect humans. Some of the uh, critiques questions you might have is like, yeah, it's kind of fun, you know, cute little uh, robot. Here you can see the frog with uh, the king of the Netherlands, uh, King William Alexander. And, uh, uh, but, you know, you don't see robots in the street every day. So, you know, Evers, why are you developing robots that can socially interact with us? Whereas it's like kind of useless, you know, we don't really use them at all. And that may be true, and it's, it's actually very true that none of the robots I have developed actually have ever come off a conveyor belt or off the shelf into a solution. But along the way, we make many different discoveries. So for instance, the, the little frog robot, the localization algorithm that I just showed you uh, that detected people uh, ended up in the then uh, new class of Mercedes for pedestrian uh, recognition. So to be able to brake in time for pedestrians, automatic braking. So it's very often that yeah, the things we have to discover to find a holistic solution to the problem we're trying to address, i.e. we want to put a, a robotic service out in, in the real world and it, to, in, to interact socially, elements of that end up in the market much earlier than the robotic technology as a whole will. Of course, the next step is then to say, okay, it can recognize pedestrians, but how to leverage this, the social aspect of it. And that's, of course, the next step. If a car can reason about people on the streets, and of course, this brings many ethical concerns that we have to discuss, uh, but, but just the concept behind it for now is that say that you can recognize that there's a family or a group of people that belong together. Then if one of those people starts crossing the street, the likelihood that the other people in that group cross the street goes up. So the car can make a much more accurate prediction of what the future may look like in a street environment and be much better prepared to make sure that there is a safe driving situation. Um, and here you can see what they look like. We actually developed that for a later uh, robot called the Spencer robot. And here you can see um, you can see people uh, moving in a corridor in, a, in an airport. Spencer robot was developed for an airport environment. And um, uh, as people are moving, the, the computer analyzes how they might belong together. So that might be the dynamics in their movement, their velocity. Uh, might mean that their noses are pointed towards each other. There's something about the movement that suggests that they belong together. Because as it learns from lots and lots of examples of people that move together, people that don't move together, over time, the computer is able to make a, a, a quite an accurate, accurate prediction of what constitutes a group, who belong together and who don't. And when you have that, you have the ability to develop technology that can be kind of socially sensitive, like Spencer Robots, who, who was developed to guide people from one gate to the other if it changes. This is in Schiphol Airport. And you can imagine if there's a group of people, it's quite difficult to navigate. And, and you always have that little trolley beeping behind you and it scares everyone. You don't know where to go. But this robot knows when there's a group and it will go around the group, even if people are apart a little bit in a, in a, say, a polite way. And it will also know who the group is that it needs to guide and and will and will when one of those people is gone it'll know oh my group's not complete and and will respond to that so it'll have a social awareness 
And of course, this is a really uh, fun robot, a fun environment, and but we never got it to operate in the way we wanted to because it attracts so much attention. Everybody wanted to make selfies with it, so it couldn't go for two meters without everybody stopping it to make selfies. And the group that was being guided would then go, hey, this is our robot, we need to get to our gate. And uh, the novelty effect is, of course, very strong with, with these type of, of robots. Here you can see what it looks like if robot just looks at space. There's enough space. This is a top view, top down view. There's enough space between these three people so a robot can easily plot its paths through them. But if it starts to analyze with a kind of social intelligence module, it'll look at the dynamics of their movements. You know, does, are their noses pointed towards each other? Are there, there are aspects of the movements that suggest that they might belong together? And then it'll plot the course around them. And indeed, in this case, uh, the person on the left was taking a photo of the two people on the right. So I guess the robot still kind of photobombed, but at least it was behind them and, and didn't go straight through with them. Uh, another example of robotics and artificial intelligence that I think is really important is, is this notion of telepresence robotics. And very often we talk about robots, people say, oh, fully autonomous robots are really important because they can do everything. They kind of expect the butler robot to come into the house and do everything, do the dishes, look at the kids, uh, do the washing. Uh, but of course, that is uh, very difficult to do because it would have to go across all these contexts. In the meantime, I think we are overlooking the real application area, which is telepresent robotics. In this case, you can see a robot, uh, this is early days of development, that will allow you to be socially present, say physically present, somewhere where you are not physically present. And of course, in the idea that if you engage in lifelong learning or if you work throughout different phases of your life, you uh, have, might have periods where you cannot be there physically present. And now with COVID, of course, this is super relevant. Uh, if you can't be physically present, how can you be optimally socially present? So in this case, we try to think, okay, what can we have the robots do autonomously? How can we make sure that things like keeping the right distance as you walk along with someone in the corridor or keep the right distance when you're standing still and talking with each other or if someone can't hear you, that the volume is automatically adjusted, that the robot leans towards the person that they're talking to so that it's clear who is being addressed. The robot does all that autonomously so that you can really focus on engaging socially with people there. And uh, this, is, this is, of course, a, a very interesting application area. How can you lift that barrier of physical presence? How can we make a situation where you can be socially present without being really present? So this is a kind of fun example. Here you can see uh, two ladies in France. They are waiting for their grandchild to, to join them. And... Um, that's a little bit of a delay on it. Let's see, hope it goes okay. And, you know, they are, this is kind of anticipation. The grandchild is coming. And here you can see kind of what happens as the grandchild finally approaches. And look at the moment when the robot is there. And right now, did you see that the lady stepped just a tiny step back? And it just shows the robot made a mistake. It came too close, too close for comfort because she, she stepped back. She, she wasn't sure if the robot's going to stop in time. So obviously there was a, a social mistake made. And what would normally happen is that a robot kind of goes, oh, that's a, a non-reward for that one. Next time I'll store that. Next time I might need to keep more distance, maybe with this specific person or maybe in general. But that's not really social behavior. Social behavior is that you repair the mistake as you are making it. You'll notice, oh, I got too close. You go, oops, sorry, move back a little bit. So we really need robots to repair those mistakes online in real time, which, which means you end up in a little social dance where you, you get too close, you move back a bit, that person moves to you until you establish the right distance that you both feel comfortable with. And it, it's that subtlety and give and take of responding and repairing that I think is essential for robots to be optimally integrated in any work or social environment. This is an example of a, a more later project where we are trying to lift that barrier of physical presence. At the moment, so what um, you see in practice is that you... You can imagine that um, 
when you are uh, when you're working together but you're at a distance say that you have to operate a machine together you have to fix something together but one of you is represented by a robot where the other person is physically present which is now uh, you know uh, become slowly becoming a reality during covid time we really want to figure out how can we create a situation where it almost feels like you're more present than you were if you would be in the same room together that you can feel what you are touching on the other side and that the person who is there say with the robot who represents you kind of feels like you are there and of course this is a combination of augmented reality virtual reality haptics we have to have a lot of AI in there to kind of predict what might happen in the future so that you know you can have a very dynamic interaction uh, if we are able to get to a situation where you can be physically present while you are not actually present together and it feels real um, this might be a real breakthrough also for instance in transport and the need for flying would be greatly reduced uh, it might be a, a, a real game changer of course the experience will be very important that you're not <laughs> locked in a room 24 7 with a with a virtual reality camera on your head that's not uh, that's not very nice experience but of course we are trying to find ways that are natural that feel natural and that feel very social okay Mm, I think the examples that I've shown you, uh, I think what is really important is that in the real world, uh, it's not very often that you have one robot working with one person, whereas a lot of the, the available technology out there is, is intended for single use. But if you in, interact with a robot in any work or social environment, it'll mostly be multiple people interacting with either one or multiple robots. So we wanted to see if a robot can learn socially from a group, but also interact socially with the group. In this case, you can see a robot that is able to scan a room, see all the clutter, analyze what clutter is there, and imagine how it can be sorted, I don't know, by color, by, by kind, etc. And as it does that, it plans a game. And the, the game with it, it'll engage in with children in that game as they sort all the clutter, all the toys, say, and, uh, and and put that together and it's interesting um, that is interesting because as the robot is is um, executing the game it'll it'll keep track of the children's social interaction so we'll try to find out okay are these kids playing nicely with each other or is a child left out and for instance if a child's left out it can adapt the game in a way that the child gets a more important role or an essential role to to pull them in so we want the robot to co-engage in pro-social behavior to maybe not become part of the group but, but stimulate the group to optimize social behavior and here you behind me you can see how we've done that how we've analyzed how children play together how they play together positive sense what happens when they play together and it's in a negative sense can we automatically detect that what are intervention strategies that a robot could use that are also developmentally valuable to allow these children to engage in teamwork together and and have a, an optimal social interaction with each other and how can the robot kind of deploy those strategies to engage children and of course, we did that research here with children, but uh, really when you look at any work team, you know, there are many strategies that are needed to make sure that the work team engage pro-socially uh, and, and optimize their creativity, optimize their collaboration with each other. And it's kind of interesting to think of an agent as trying to A, give feedback on how well the team is uh, engaging in a teamwork, but also can be an, an active um, an active participant to be able to allow a positive change to happen in any team. Um, this is a project that uh, I'm particularly <laughs> very proud of, I, I guess I would say, and it, it's about um, a robot to support therapists of children with severe autism, to allow them to learn basic uh, communication and emotional skills, social emotional skills. And of course, this is essential because as you are a kid and you don't behave quite in the way that people expect, people forgive you. But as you become an adult, people will feel threatened by you. And you can imagine if you are in a certain situation, you don't respond in a way uh, that is meant. You don't show, for instance, I don't know, respect or you, you start laughing when you're not supposed to. You could, you could really be in danger. So it's 
really essential that uh, children with severe autism somehow are taught these basic skills. Um, and these children often don't have access to language. They, they don't uh, communicate with language. They often do not understand language. It's hard for them to communicate with people in any case because there's so much going on in our faces. Everything's moving. There's sound. There's just too much going on. And um, for them to come into a situation where learning can take place. So as you can see in the video behind me, we developed the robot and the therapist engages the robot. The therapist talks to the robot and the child is also interacting with the robot. But it's really the, the, it allows for a mediation between the therapist and the child and to put them in a situation where learning can happen. On top of that, the robot is able to be able to analyze the facial expression of the children. So even if a therapist over months and months feels that Actually, child uh, has not changed the way it uses their face, for instance, to make a smile uh, in a certain situation. The computer might say, well, actually, we have seen a difference in use in facial mus muscles because it, it can, of course, analyze it at a micro level and put all the timings uh, right next to each other. So this is a very powerful tool for these therapists. You can imagine uh, that it's a wonderful example of not technology, AI, robotics, replacing people, but really empowering people. These therapists were not able to reach this group of children before, could hardly do anything for them. But now they have a tool that with quite a, a large percentage of the children, not all, but quite a, a large group of those children, they can get them in a, in a, in a situation where learning can take place and where they learn these very, very important skills. And um, so I think this is a, a, a wonderful example of that, of how if you get technology right, if you get the design right, and you leverage the social situation in which it has to operate, you can really empower people to do something they weren't able to do before, to enrich their profession. Uh, this little video, I wanted to show you this example. This was, we, we ran this research in many different countries, and this is in Serbia. You can see how the the boy is kind of shielding his face from the therapist. So he doesn't, he, he can't handle looking at her. And she's talking to him through the robot. And you can see he is responding to the robot. Here you can see him smiling. And his parents uh, came and they said they had never seen him smile before. Whereas for us, he, he was a, actually a high performing uh, uh, participant in our studies. And it, I think it's a, just a wonderful example of how these therapists are using these tools, are, are now having the ability to use these tools to really make a difference. I wanted to leave you with uh, some final thoughts on a, the importance of this type of research, but also to kind of uh, humblify it. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, uh, it's so expensive to build all those robots. They cost millions, which is true. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's for us, if you want to know if we can build that AI, it'll be 10 years and it'll cost us a whole lot of money. And then we don't even know if, if the results will be what we need it to be. And I just want to make a real case for creativity here. I think you can find out with a little bit of money, with a lot of creativity, a lot before you invest into building very expensive robots, very expensive AI. So let me give you an example of that here. This is a view from a driverless car. This is in Mendo Altos. It's a collaboration with Cornell Tech and Stanford University. You can see this guy is like, oh my God, a car with no driver. Shall I go? What if it, what if it goes over me? No, I, I don't do it. But the lady that comes from the right doesn't have any qualms with it. And it just shows that everybody responds completely differently to technology. And it's very hard to predict. It doesn't matter how many user studies you do, how much designing you do, it's, it's very important to get it absolutely right so that the technology communicates to the user exactly what it's going to do so that people will understand it completely and be, and be able to trust it, will be able to see it for what it is. And to get that right, you know, of course, uh, that, that would take a lot of money to develop uh, an algorithm in a car that works. And then you have the algorithm, you have to test it. So let me give you an example of how we did that. So we also wanted to know 
what kind of car behavior, the way it would stop, would communicate to someone, I am stopping for you. And you can, you can trust me that I won't drive until you go. And what does that look like? Is it like a hard brake? Is it like little brakes? What, what does it look like? Is that flashing lights? Who knows? And of course, if you want to develop all these algorithms in autonomous cars and then test them, that will be hugely expensive. So you can see what we did. We hid a driver in a car that's not autonomous. And so in a very cheap way, very creative way, we were able to test all these algorithmic uh, uh, strategies, all these strategies of car behavior before uh, actually developing it and then spending all that money and, and final testing it. So I, I wanted to leave you with that before we start our discussion. The main point that I wanted to make was that uh, it's really extremely important if you develop artificial intelligence uh, robotics that is to be used in, a, in an environment where there are a lot of people, where people have to A, work together and B, work together, optimize their collaboration with systems or with robots, that this technology is socially intelligent, that it understands the social situation in which it is to operate and it understands the social and emotional status of the people around it. This brings many ethical questions. I'm very happy to engage with you on that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of how difficult it is to, to do that right. I feel we should do that right. Number two is that if you can make this technology, it should, you should, we should be able to use this technology to empower people to really uh, reach for goals that we were not able to do without the help of this technology. Um, and, and those are really wonderful projects to work on, really wonderful to push science further on. And uh, thirdly, I wanted to make the case that even though, of course, uh, the vision of robotics and artificial intelligence is really fascinating, can be very appealing, it's not always the right solution. So you have to really understand the problem really well. And by being very creative about investigating the problem, researching various solutions, you can, in a, in a low cost, uh, a low risk way, really understand what solution will get you to the goal that you need to have. So not to just start building robots and AI nilly willy, but really understand the problem before you get started. Thank you very much. So we're back live with Vanessa. Vanessa, thank you very much for this talk. Let's start by this uh, question that I asked you before the talk. Uh, what will be your reaction if you discover the results of your work made possible the massive surveillance of face, face expression of the Uyghur community by the Chinese government? In other words, how do you deal personally with the usage that can be done of your work? Thanks, Christian. That is uh, a really, really tricky question. I wanted to start by saying that you know, of course, we, we developed this technology to solve problems and, and to make people's lives better. You know, we want to help them work, receive high quality health care, get educated, you know, deal with crises. And, and the work that we do is, is public property. And it's, uh, it's taxpayers like everybody that is watching this today uh, that are paying for it. So it's only fair that it should be public. And the examples that I gave in my talk there is really a long road from when we invent something to when it actually ends up in a real product like a car. It, it's hard to predict what the market will do, what, what society will take out of our research and, and decide to use. And um, yes, C uh, concerning the, the, um, the autonomous car, I got a question that, uh, that is saying, according to Dr. Luc Julia, I don't know who it is. Fully autonomous vehicle will never exist. Do you have uh, an opinion on that? Because you well, work I, I with would, it. Well, I think it exists. It's just whether we will allow it to uh, to actually go on the road. And so, and that's not a, a problem that an engineer like myself would solve, right? It's a it's a problem that 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 the society has to solve. That the government has to decide on regulations. Um, yeah, yeah. based on regulation and law, okay. and we will have Larry Lessing, Lawrence Lessing that will explain you, uh, explain us the, the point of view from the law concerning the evolution of, of technology. I got a question from Sarah who is asking, a human brain consumes much less energy and resources than a robot. Uh, do you think uh, this will be at some point a blocking point for robot development? 
Well, absolutely now. I think this is a really great point. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to solve that problem of getting energy without all these electrical cables. So we need some kind of a solution like blood, you know, like a fluid solution that allows us to get energy to, to the artificial brain in a, in a much more uh, sustainable way. And this is, a, this is a huge problem. This is why there is so much research, of course, a more organic type of, of robotics. And, and it's kind of waiting for breakthroughs there. A lot of questions regarding the... The pandemic, uh, what are the results of your experience? What will be the results of your experience with the masked driver uh, in the autonomous car? And uh, what happened concerning your work and your experimentation due to the pandemic? You know, the social di distances, uh, the masks. Uh, it's, not very, the, it's not very easy to look at the emotions when people are all masked in everyday life. What happened in the past year concerning your work? Yeah, so this is a problem that a lot of groups have looked at and uh, they are getting better and better. I think uh, we're pretty good at recognizing uh, people even with, with masks. Um, so, so that is a, a problem that is kind of being solved in, in different places in the world. Uh, I think what, what does come up is that this idea of telepresence has become much more important. You know, how can we be close to loved ones when they're in hospital and we're not allowed to visit? And how can we be together even though we can't be together? So that type of research will definitely uh, get a lot more attention and hopefully we can find some solutions that are more natural so that, that people can actually be together much better than, than they are during a pandemic. Okay, so the study uh, switched to a remote uh, also in this field. A uh, question from Emmanuel who said, thanks a lot, Vanessa, it was really interesting. Do you think that robots can console and comfort sad people? Oh, that's a, that's a real trick question. Um, can they comfort uh, sick people or could they provide comfort to people that might feel sad? Potentially, yes. I mean, there must be a way uh, for some people that they can provide comfort. Uh, I've myself looked at a problem, for instance, people during an earthquake that are uh, trapped under rubble to find like little robots that could find them and keep them company to alert the location, but also to provide uh, contact to loved ones to them, or uh, if that's not possible, to provide some uh, uh, comfort. Uh, it's so theoretically it should be possible. The question is, when is this appropriate? I, I con I'm concerned that this might be used in places where there can be human comfort and, and that it's replaced by this artificial comfort. And that, that's a direction I would not want to go, of course. Thank you. Another question. Uh, there's a lot of questions related what, to what is normal. Uh, how do you react uh, when, of course, you're switching from Asia to Europe or uh, uh, America uh, concerning the normality? Uh, things that are normal here are not the same. You've, uh, you've shown us a lot of experimentation. Uh, but how do you deal uh, fundamentally with that? Is there a pattern that, okay, there's some rules and paradigms that are uh, the same everywhere, or is it really different in every country or continent? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, to be honest, I don't really know. Uh, co going to Singapore and to Asia, I realized how arrogant I was, thinking, oh, you know, this is how you do things, uh, let me show you. Um, of course, there are, uh, you know, in many ways, they are much more advanced in, in, at this end of the world, and I've, I've learned much more than that I've been able to teach others. So uh, I think uh, it, by, by trying to understand the problems in very different contexts in different places in the world, it, it gives you a much deeper understanding of how these problems exist and what, what solution it should be. And sometimes that solution is more local, sometimes that solution can be a little bit more general, but, but there will always be very specific kind of personal reasons why people will want to accept the technology or not, and, and when it makes it perfect for them. And I do believe, uh, like the, the person in, with, that asked the question, that, uh, that, is, that asks for a very personalized solution. It's very hard to make something that everyone, uh, that will help everyone. <laughs> Some questions are related also to the definition of a robot. Uh, 
Will you say that the definition of what is a robot has evolved in the recent years? Is it always the same definition? Is it evolving also on the way we define what is a robot? Uh, these, these questions are excellent. I would say if I line up 10 of my colleagues and you ask us to give a definition of a robot, you will get like 15 definitions. Right? <laughs> we'll all have a different idea of what a robot is. And it fits our own research best. So we're very selfish about it. Um, so yeah, I, I think okay, it depends on you. When we will have social robots, let's call them, uh, them like this, in every day's life. Uh, maybe your answer will be, we already have them, uh, but will it be uh, in 10 years, on 15 years, uh, we will interact in everyday uh, life with uh, social robots? How do you see the, uh, uh, when people will, c c will work and live with robots, uh, like some of the experiments that you, that you have done? Yes, I think you've, you've seen that the robots that I've been working on, you don't really see them in everyday life. You know, you don't go to the train station and there's a robot there giving you a ticket or, you know, I don't know, checking your tickets in, in the, inside the train station or anywhere else. So it's, it's mostly that as we are waiting for R2-D2, you know, we wait to open the door, R2-D2 comes in, does the dishes, does the vacuum in, looks after the children. While we're waiting for that, I think slowly everything is becoming more robotic. You know, our, our, our car is becoming a robot and our, uh, um, our music, uh, the music that we play at home, it comes from a machine that you could describe as a robot that uses intelligence to, to pick the music for you and, and you can talk to it. So slowly, everyday objects are becoming more and more robotic. I think one, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Unfortunately, this was a long talk. We have a very short time. We are running out of time for questions. Thank you Sorry. very much for being with us. And have a good night, because I believe it's, uh, it's late <laughs> in Singapore. Thank you very much for being with us. Bye-bye, and have a nice day. Bye.